God bless you, everyone. My name is Dave, and today's topic is called, with the title, Watch Your Behavior. So what will we talk about today? We'll talk about, number one, careless words from idle chat. We'll find out what idle chat's all about. Number two, we'll talk about judging others. Number three, we'll talk about the emotions of anger. And number four, God's thinking is not man's thinking. Number five, God knows what you need. And number six, the practical importance of prayer. And that covers our topic of watch your behavior. We'll start off with uh, careless words from idle chat. And so let's talk about what idle chat is. Number one, it's gossip. And number two, it's lying. Those are the two things we'll talk about. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Jesus spoke plainly about our idle words, yet his warning often goes unheeded. The scripture I had just read, but I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken, is Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. And so this is an example of Jesus speaking about idle words. But Not many people pay attention to it. Jesus said that for every idle word, there will be time of accounting on the day of judgment. We would expect Jesus to condemn profane and vile use of the tongue. But what about idle words? Idle words are things we say carelessly without concern for their impact on others. Idle words come from an action of little thought. Intelligent consideration is not what idle words are about. We too quickly assume that the sins of our tongue are minor sins. We think that God will overlook those minor sins. Jesus was fully aware of the devastating nature of our words, for the idle words that come from our mouth give a bad picture of the condition of our heart. And we talk, we'll see it in Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 through 20. And I'll read Matthew chapter 15, 17 through 20. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil, thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. And that's in Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 through 20. Let's talk about hurting words. They can be from any type of idle chat. It starts from the heart, goes to the head, and explodes out of the mouth. Again, it starts from the heart, goes to the head, and explodes out of the mouth. Hurting words like rumors, gossip, disrespect, manipulation by opinion, and deception through self-interest. See how that works? Hurting words starts from the heart, goes to the head, and explodes out of the mouth. You see, hurtful words cause someone pain, and it is easier to point out even the cause of your anguish. But words that were never meant, or words that we have thoughtlessly put out there may give someone a different type of torment. They may cause someone to question oneself if they were not good enough to be worthy of the words that were initially said. They may cause someone to look back and ask, did I do something wrong? What could I have done differently? They may cause someone to think hard to try to be better and sooner or later not to trust. Now let's take a look at Matthew once again. Again, that's chapter 15, 17 through 20. Don't you see whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. See, idle words are, oh, and I just finished. That was uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 through 20. Idle words are also words of rumors and gossip. Rumors and gossip. Gossip means to tell secret information to another person. Passing on personal details about a neighbor to another neighbor is an example of gossip. A person who habitually spreads intimate or private rumors or facts. This is what we're talking about. Idle talk about someone's private or personal matters, especially someone not present. The root cause of gossip is almost always without fail, some sort of jealousy. The more successful you are, the more attractive, the more kind, and the more self-assured, the more people will gossip. They do it to try and bring you down. They do it to try and build themselves up. 
The gossip is also indicating insecurity. A secure person doesn't feel the need to spread rumors for the attention or to backstab someone and would rather spend their energies on something positive and uplifting. Here are seven ways you can tell if you gossip too much. The people around you love drama. You can't wait to tell secrets. People stop sharing with you. You have trouble coming up with other conversation. You feel better about yourself when sharing info. People come to you with juicy information. People are talking about you. These are some of the examples. The purpose of gossip is to tear a person down and erode their self-esteem. It's in that state where people may begin experiencing mental health issues such as eating disorders, suicidal thoughts, depression, and anxiety. Gossip can ruin friendships, relationships, and marriages. It hurts your personal and professional reputation if you are labeled a gossiper. It can create huge issues about trust between people and teams. It hurts the way people and departments communicate with each other and even their clients and customers. Let's talk about some examples of rumors, unverified pieces of information. It often involves speculation. Um, it's, uh, it is unknown if information is true. It may change slightly as we told. And usually it's harmful to other people. Now, some examples of gossip. It's a juicy or scandalous story. It's hurtful for another person. As I said, it's unknown if the information is true. It usually involves things not discussed publicly, and it may humili humiliate the person it's about. When people feel bad about themselves, they, they sometimes will target other people with gossip and rumors to try to make themselves feel better. As a result, they talk about others as a way to deflect attention from themselves. It's done through gossip and rumors. They do this for a variety of reasons. Number one, to feel accepted. Number two, to get attention. Uh, number three, to gain power. Number four, to get revenge. Number five, to relieve boredom. And finally, some other reason. Gossip is shared by the misinformed who often sound like fools while creating drama and disorder. These kinds of people start a conversation with, I shouldn't be telling you this, but dot, dot, dot. There is always a quote that says, the one who always insisted that they don't want drama is involved with drama. People who try to destroy with rumors are destroying their own reputation. Ignorance is judging someone from the rumors that you hear and believe. Stupidity is spreading those rumors, thinking you will come out a better person. A set of idle words is also lying. The word lie is one which instantly generates a vision and feeling of gross negativity. It embodies the sort of morality that most people would wish to steer well clear from. Despite this, there are many individuals who are prepared to spin works of fiction to their friends, families, and partners. People who lie seem to do this with very little difficulty as if it's well practiced. Lying begins to put great strain on all aspects of relationship and if left unchecked, it will break the relationship. Now here are ways lying hurts relationships. Number one, lies erode trust. Number two, lying shows a lack of respect. Number three, lying demonstrates selfishness. Number four, the liar is conning themselves too. Number five, lies make a relationship unbalanced. Number six, one lie will lead to another. Number seven, lying is a loss of integrity. And number eight, lying is a failed character. The book of Proverbs uh, in chapter 17, verse 28, encourages us to speak less rather than risking saying something offensive. And that's in Proverbs 17, verse 28. And the scripture says, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Now that's Proverbs 17, verse 28. Often when we have nothing significant to say, we are tempted to speak hurtful and idle words. The more time we spend in idle chatter, the greater the likelihood that we will say things that are harmful. In the Bible, James cautioned believers to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And I'll read James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that's James chapter 1, verse 19. We are in much less danger of saying something offensive when we are listening rather than uh, when we are speaking. Think carefully about the words that come from your mouth. We should all speak only words that uplift and bring grace to others, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And the scripture says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Now, the question is, do you need to speak less? Do you need to be more careful about the kind of humor you use? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you evaluate whether your words build up others or whether they destroy and hurt others. Now, our second topic, judging others. Are you a judgmental person? Have you sometimes been more judgmental towards others? Are people judgmental towards you? What does it mean to be judgmental? And how does that compare to being discerning? Let's go to the Bible and see what we can learn. And we first go to Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. There is a significant difference between judgment and discernment. Discernment is the ability to attain sharp perceptions well. Discernment is defined as the ability to notice the fine point details and the ability to understand and comprehend something. Now, if you describe someone as discerning, you mean that they are able to judge which things of a particular kind are good and which are bad. Our problem is that we like to sit in the judgment seat and declare condemnation upon those whom we think have sinned. Scripture warns us not to judge others based on our own self-righteous righteousness because we all fall, fall short of the glory of God and only God can know the state of anyone's heart. It is suggested to follow a two-step approach when exercising sound judgment. First, we're to avoid rashly judging such as condemning others based on our own feelings of superiority since we all have the tendency to sin. Second, and after we've corrected our own transgressions, we have the clarity necessary to help others overcome their sins. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, the scripture says, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5. To keep from being hypocritically judgmental, we must first focus on gaining the discernment necessary to correct our own shortcomings by rooting our judgment in the knowledge of Scripture. The discernment of Christians must gain is the ability to ascertain what's true and what's false, to distinguish between what is biblically right and wrong in all areas of life. A discerning person doesn't readily believe everything he sees or hears, but keeps his reasoning aligned with God's word so as to walk justly and steer clear of false prophecies. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And again, that's 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Now let's go to uh, some more. Let's learn more. We can grow in sound judgment by studying scripture and praying for the Holy Spirit to fill us with discernment. Let's jump to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And how from infancy have you known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? And that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. At times, our judgmental attitude can seem to provide us an excuse not to become involved in God's redemptive work in someone's life. The Bible reminds us that God will treat us with the same grace or severity with which we treat others. In Luke chapter 6, verse 38, the scripture says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure, you will use it to measure measured to you. And that's in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. God commands us not to judge others, but he does want us to be discerning. Jesus said we would know people's spiritual condition by the fruit of their lives. And we see that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. By, the, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And that's Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. God said grapes are not produced by thorn bushes. If a person's life produces thorns, we can assume that a person is not a grapevine. Are we being judgmental? No, we're being discerning. Discerning is not the same as being judgmental. Remember, someone with a discerning taste or a discerning eye is good at distinguishing the good from the bad and sifting out the gems from the junk. We have been instructed in the Bible to observe the lives of others so that we can help them while avoiding any sinful influence. 
our discerning eye should be the voice of God so that we can help others. Dear Lord, allow me to be a vessel for your will with a discerning eye to help others. You will be helpful to others only if you see them as God does. If you have been judgmental of others, ask for forgiveness and pledge yourself to let God use you as his minister of reconciliation. We can understand this by going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And the scripture says, all this is from God who reconciled us to, to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will not, and you will be forgiven. And that's in Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Next, let's talk about the emotion of anger. Are you an angry Christian? What do we mean when we say anger? What is the behavior? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Few things are more destructive to Christians than anger. Anger overcomes and destroys peace and joy. Once that happens, no one would ever think of you as a Christian. Anger causes us to lose our self-control. It causes us to say and do things we would otherwise never consider. Anger turns into bitterness that eats away at our hearts. Scripture consistently commands believers to put away anger and list it as one of the sins of the flesh. Yes, anger is a sin and can lead to even greater sin. At times, we try to defend our anger. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. We talked about that before. As additional proof, we argue that Jesus cleansed the temple in righteous indignation. Ephesians refers to the anger that does not lead to sin. Jesus was capable of being angry without sinning. When Jesus cleared the temple, scripture does not indicate that he was angry. I repeat, scripture does not indicate that he was angry. Let's look up the following scriptures from the Bible. I'll read from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 through 14. It's Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. And Luke chapter 19, verse 45 through 46. So I'll start off with <laughs> Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 through 14. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money and changers and the benches of those who are selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blink, the blind, I should say, and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. And that's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 through 14. So let's now go to Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money and changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And that's Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 18. Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 45 through 46. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And that's in Luke chapter 19, verse 45 through 46. We must be careful not to justify our anger with scripture. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 commands us to put away all anger. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Again, that's Ephesians chapter four, verse 31. That does not mean that we cease to have strong convictions or lose our desire for justice. It does mean we refuse to allow the sins of others to cause us to sin. Anger does not bring about God's redemptive work. Far more often, it hinders what God is working to accomplish. If you feel that you have a righteous anger because of something that has happened, see if you are holding anger in your heart without sin. Is your anger turning into bitterness? Is your anger causing you to speak in an unchristian manner to someone or to gossip about them? Is your anger causing you to make excuses for your own ungodly behavior? 
Is your anger preventing you from acting in a loving, redemptive, and Christ-like way towards someone? You must examine any anger within you and allow God to remove any sinful attitudes that your anger may have produced. Let's go to number four. God's thinking is not man's thinking. In our sinful ways, we spend more time telling God something rather than listening to what God is trying to tell us. Unfortunately, we don't understand what God is trying to tell us or how to make an effort to find out. Instead, we try to figure it all out in a carnal way based on what we know of our earthly world. God wants us to see the big picture, but we escape it. Did you know God's thinking is not man's thinking? I say to you again, I say and ask you again, did you know that God's thinking is not man's thinking? And Colossians chapter two, verse eight, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on hum human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world and not based on Christ. That's Colossians chapter two, verse eight. There is a subtle temptation that encourages Christians to be practical. Being practical is actually doing or using something in the physical realm rather than with faith in the spiritual realm. So when we say Christians are to be practical, it means we are to do God's work in a man's way instead of God's way. This is a mistake. Many Christians are lost as they are not following the light of the Lord that shows God's way. And getting results becomes a primary focus of many Christians. This means not operating under God's time. We control things in our time, and that is an out-of-control state of behavior. Going outside of God's timing is out of order. It almost seems that we believe that the end justifies the means. That means we are in a rush. Don't make the mistake of being led away by the world's reasoning. The world's reasoning and logic is not God's reasoning and logic. Now let's go to number five. God knows what you need. Seek out his wisdom. Let's take a moment to look at Matthew chapter six, verse eight. Your heavenly father knows you. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. And that's in Matthew chapter six, verse eight. Even before we call on God, he has already begun to provide all that we need. We see that in the scripture, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24, and I'll read it to you. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will still hear. You see, Jesus wanted his disciples to learn how intimately God knew and loved each and every one of them. That is why he told them to pray. He wanted to hear the voice from the disciples. He wanted a relationship. He assured them that even before they prayed, God knew all about their situation. Prayer is not designed us to inform God of our needs. He already knows them. Why then should we pray? Prayer enables us to experience God more intimately. The more a child experiences the loving provision of a parent, the more convinced he becomes of his parent's unrelenting love. Often a parent will anticipate a child's need before the child recognizes it and be prepared in advance to provide that need. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we will face today and next week and next year. He is eager for us to experience him as he provides for us. To our surprise, we often discover that God knows far better than we do uh, for what is best for us. At times, we assume that we know what would benefit us. We can even be foolish enough to assume that we don't require anything of God. Yet God wants us to go to him in our need. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And that's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. He is ready to show his strength through our weakness. Our heavenly father knows exactly what's best for us. And he is prepared to provide for every need if we will only ask. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. As we, And that's uh, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Now let's talk about number six, uh, the practical importance of prayer. There is a practical importance of prayer. It increases the sound and the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of us. If we increase the Holy Spirit, we can have less room for our foolish actions. Seek God through prayer. In Luke chapter three, verse 21 through 22. Again, that's Luke chapter three, verse 21 through 22. When all the people were baptized, Jesus 
also was baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a physical appearance like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. I take delight in you. And that's in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 through 22. The greatest moments in your life come through prayer. When Jesus prayed, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him. The Spirit came upon the disciples as they gathered to pray on the day of Pentecost. It is the day the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles, causing them to speak in tongues. When the disciples pray together after Pentecost, their gathering place was shaken and they were given the courage and confidence to proclaim the gospel throughout the city. Pentecost is the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and other disciples following the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. If we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Pentecost marks the beginning of the Christian church's mission to the world. We have the Holy Spirit through Jesus to God as our direct connection to the will of the Lord. We must pray. Prayer is not a substitute for hard work. Prayer is the work. God does the things in and through our lives by prayer that he does in no other way. As we pray and as our attention is turned towards God, we become more receptive to aligning our lives with his will. God will not equip us with his power while we are racing off to our next appointment. The Holy Spirit will not empower us if we are unaware of what God is trying to say. God requires us to complete our complete attention before he will fill us with the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit. That means we must be spiritually awake. If you want to learn how to pray, use Jesus as your model. Jesus did not always receive what he asked for, but his prayers were always heard and always answered. If we go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, the scripture says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. And that's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. If you do not sense the Holy Spirit's power in your life, you may not be spending adequate time in your prayer. Perhaps you are pursuing your own agenda rather than seeking the Father's will. God's will. If that is true, you may have abandoned the reason for prayer before God's answer comes. If you will commit yourself to spend continued time in prayer, you must ask for God's purpose in you. God's answers to his purpose. God does not answer to your purpose. It's God's purpose that he has in you that matters. The good thing is that the purpose is wonderful. We see that in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that's in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God will work in your life just as he did in the lives of Jesus and his disciples. The best way to discern God's voice from your own is to practice stepping out and acting on his voice when you think it's him. As you take those steps of faith, he helps you sort out and recognize his voice through a process of learning. Do this when you pray. Come to God with your request for guidance. Wait in silence and uh, for, for God to speak for several minutes. Write down any scripture, songs, impressions, or pictures God gives you. So what have we talked about today? We've talked about six things. Number one, careless words from idle chat. We talked about judging others. Number three, the emotion of anger. Number four, God's thinking is not man's thinking. Number five, God knows what you need. And number six, the practical importance of prayer. So now let's take a moment to pray together. I ask you to raise your hands and close your eyes and pray with me at this hour. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today because I want to hear your voice. I want you to always speak to me just like you spoke to the prophets of the past. I pray that you will speak to me clearly in the name of Jesus. I, Lord, I praise you as my shepherd, for you are the one who speaks so that I may hear your voice and follow you where you lead. 
I thank you, O oh God, for telling us the truth about yourself and about ourselves. Father God, help me to have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to today. Dear God, open my heart to your impressions and please give me clo clo please help close my ears to the whisperings of the evil one. Lord, today I stand as an intercessor for those who are not listening to your word or your spirit who stray from your truth. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me. Our topic today has been watch your behavior. My name is Dave.